we have um, uh, we have questions for Nicola Sturgeon. Scotland's relatively high COVID death rate, of course prompted questions over Scotland's strategy. We also want to talk to her about her support for um, the Christmas loosening of regulations when she is actually advising people should stay at home at Christmas. And, of course, what could be an even more seismic uh, development from all this pandemic, which is that it forces uh, Scotland into independence, where support for it has been rising fast through the pandemic, mm. a lot of it put down to support for Nicola Sturgeon personally. But despite the chequered record of her government this year, her leadership style is certainly resonating with Scots. And will that take them out of the UK? That is a huge question. Well, well let's we talk can be joined to Nicola now Sturgeon. by the First Minister. Good morning to you. Good morning. Um, it's good to talk to you uh, this morning, Nicola Sturgeon, but unfortunately, uh, we start with a negative, which is um, Scotland's handling of the COVID pandemic. Um, mm. There are, unfortunately, you have this record where your death rate is worse than England and the third worst in Europe. What mistakes have you made over the course of the pandemic? I'll come on directly to the mistakes point in a second because I've never tried to dodge that. But can I just correct you factually? It's not the case that Scotland's death rate, I hate that term, but you've used it to me, is worse than England's. Uh, if you look at, and you can find this information on the UK government's uh, coronavirus dashboard, uh, the numbers of people proportionately in Scotland who've died throughout the pandemic is lower in Scotland than in England and Wales. It's higher than Northern Ireland. Now, the BBC yesterday took uh, figures for a four-week period period out of a nine-month pandemic to make the point you've just made to me there. So it's not factually true uh, when you look at it across the, the course of the pandemic. But let me be clear, uh, I don't think there is an acceptable number of deaths and I'm not defending uh, a, a number of people in Scotland who've died. It's too high and I uh, deeply regret every person who has lost their lives. Um, in terms of mistakes, um, you know, I have tried not to be defensive about this. I don't think we've got everything right. I think earlier on in Scotland, across the UK, we perhaps uh, treated this in the very early stages as if it was a flu pandemic uh, rather than coronavirus that perhaps influenced some of our early decisions. I think there are other things that uh, some people legitimately will describe as mistakes. Uh, I would say it's more about a developing knowledge about the virus, things we didn't know then that we know now, uh, that perhaps we should have uh, tested more asymptomatic people earlier, and I think that is particularly uh, the case in care homes. Well, let's uh, so we've talk tried about that, because to, you, Scotland... you talk about that, and of course, mm -hmm. as you say, depends which figures you look at, but if you look at the figures for care homes, you do appear to have a, a worse record than England. Um, University of Stirling report found that in Scotland, 47% of deaths attributed to COVID-19 occurred in care homes, and that compares to 30% in England. Mm. Now, what did you get wrong there when it came to sending people well, home from hospital to care homes? Again, before I come on to the substance, which is the most important part, I just again have to, in a sense, not correct, but give a bit of context to those figures you've used. When you look at excess deaths in care homes over the course of this pandemic, actually, uh, the figure is lower in Scotland than in England, but what we see is that more of those deaths have been attributed to COVID. So there mm. are a number of excess deaths that have happened in England that, for whatever reason, have not been attributed to COVID, and it would be for others to explain why that's not the case. I don't think it is the case that we have had more people dying in care homes than elsewhere in the UK. But again, in a sense, that's irrelevant because too many people have died. The policy in care homes in Scotland in terms of discharge uh, was not different to the rest of the UK. Earlier on in the pandemic, and I, I remember this, I remember the sleepless nights I had, we thought we were seeing pictures from Italy uh, at the time of hospitals being overwhelmed by COVID, and we didn't think that was the right settings for older people, particularly those who didn't have a medical need to be in hospital. So there was a concern about not having older people in hospital as there was that tsunami of coronavirus. But why Back at that then time, wouldn't you? Why then have... wouldn't you? And this, uh, this if... applies obviously to, yeah. to wherever any of these elderly patients were. 
But mm -hmm. why wouldn't you then test an elderly person who was being discharged from yeah. hospital into care homes? I mean, you know, how much thinking did you need to put into it? That would have seemed self-evident well, that lot... if you were worried about COVID, that sending someone mm -hmm. home from hospital to yeah. a care home who could be infected would seed that amongst the care homes. And as we know, that's exactly what happened. And although you dispute the figures, unfortunately, it happened to a devastating effect in Scotland. And, and, and I'll be the last person that ever tries to, to challenge the devastation of this. The point you've just put to me is actually the point I was about to come on to there about testing. Um, and you ask, how much did we think about it? We thought about these things long, hard and deeply back then. And it's not the case now, which is why this has changed. Back then, the advice, uh, the clinical scientific advice was less clear about testing asymptomatic people. The, the advice was that the, the test was not particularly effective in people who were not displaying symptoms of coronavirus. That has changed. Uh, but back then, that was the, the position. So we didn't know back then what we knew then. That doesn't mean we didn't take steps uh, to try to protect care homes. There was guidance about uh, isolation and uh, making sure that people uh, were not coming together in care homes, very robust infection prevention and control procedures. So, you know, if I could turn the clock back, um, and I'm, you know, I'm trying to be pretty candid about this, which is maybe unusual for a politician, um, I, I would do things differently. But I, I didn't know then all of the things I know now. So we now have a very different approach to testing okay. people in care homes. Let's move on to uh, your candour about the desire for independence in Scotland. When you had the last referendum several years ago, you were very clear this was a once-in-a-lifetime moment for the Scots. That phrase was repeated ad nauseum. Once in a lifetime, once in a lifetime, once in a lifetime. And Scotland voted resoundingly not to break up the UK. Uh, now you've got your gander up, your personal polling is good, you're heading towards an election where it looks like you may do very well, and the suggestion is you're going to ignore everything you said last time about once in a lifetime, and you're going to use an election victory uh, next year to push for another referendum because you believe that's what Scottish people want. Is that the correct assessment? There's bits of that I would agree with, bits I wouldn't agree with, but I'll try and unpack that as we go, Piers. The, the first thing I would say to you right now is we're in the middle of a pandemic here. I'm trying to steer the country to the best of my ability through it, making mistakes, as we've just been talking about, as we go. Having my gander up is not particularly a, an accurate assessment of my frame of mind at, at the moment. This is not an easy time for no, but you know, you've done the maths. Right you've done the maths. You, point, see, you well, see the me, polling. Let, you let know me, where you are with it. Point. Yeah, go on then. Well, the polling is not incidental in this, Piers, because the, the point is that for any Democrat, and you know, people say, oh, respect the result of the last referendum. I do respect the result of the last referendum. That's why Scotland's not independent right now. But the polls say the opinion of people in Scotland has changed, that people want the chance to look at this again, and that a majority of people in Scotland now support independence. Okay, democracy going, cannot going be to... a right. single so moment just... in time. All right, let me... Sorry to jump in, but we're running out of time. Let... Just, just to clarify then. You would like to have a second mm. referendum, yes? Yes. And you would like to have it sooner rather than later? So pretty soon after the election, uh, which you think will validate your desire to have another referendum, yeah? Well, th th that's up to the people of Scotland to uh, no, no, I'm assuming that, I'm assuming to re-elect me on a ahead. clear mandate. OK, I'm jumping ahead, but assuming that the people of Scotland vote for you in big numbers, this may well be the case, given your popularity right now, uh, that actually you then get a position after the election where you have another referendum. But how are you going to have it if Boris Johnson refuses to let you have well, it? I, I, I really... I mean, I know you're questioning me, but this, this is turning democracy on its head. I, I'm doing the old-fashioned democratic thing. I'm going to go to an election and say to people in Scotland, you give me the authority for a legal referendum on independence. It is outrageous that I'm being asked to justify uh, the position of a prime minister whose position is that he will deny democracy. Well, you might so be outraged, to, but, my the, actually, in but surely democracy... Well, yeah, but well, surely... Hang on. But surely democracy... Democracy is actually... It is at the behest of the UK prime minister. You may not like it, but that is actually the reality, isn't it? Well, so, again, I, I ask I, you, if, I, Boris Johnson, if Boris Johnson just says no, 
and you may not like it, but he just says no. How are you actually going to get another referendum? How are you going to make it happen well, if he first, says no? The first thing I'm going to do is get the authority of the people of Scotland. And if Boris Johnson chooses to stand in its way, I'll set out then the steps we will take. But I'm going to put my faith in democracy. You know, across the Atlantic, uh, with Boris Johnson's pal, I know he's uh, used to be a pal of yours as well, we see what happens to politicians who try to stand in the way of the tide of democracy. They get swept away. Uh, this is about democracy and the ability of the people of Scotland to decide their own future. And if Boris Johnson ever finds the, the courage to come on and speak to you, then... <laughs> Perhaps you okay, can well, that's him a fair point. On that's a fair point, and you do always democracy. come on. Sir John Major, uh, who long warned that Brexit would make independence more likely, has argued that saying no to another referendum, for the reasons you've just articulated, may well help the case that you're presenting. He has suggested two referendums. Interesting in the context of what happened with Brexit. One on the issue of independence, yes or no, but the second one on the terms of a withdrawal from the UK. Given the bitter lessons we're currently enduring from Brexit, which is that many people feel they voted for something but then had no say over the terms of that then being executed, mm. do you think John Major has a good point there that two referendums, one on whether to leave and one on the terms, actually might be a sensible way through that? Uh, no, I don't, um, because there's a difference between Brexit and if you look at the 2014 independence referendum, we fought the independence referendum on a detailed prospectus. People knew what they were voting for, and that's what I would be proposing again, unlike Brexit, where you had the side of the bus and, and nothing else, and therefore people didn't really know the detail of what they were voting for. But, you know, in that question there, you've summed up uh, the ridiculous uh, nature of the Tory position. You've got some of them saying no referendums ever, and others saying... Uh, well, we should have two referendums. They're just trying. If they can't stand in the way of democracy, their next attempt is to try to uh, rig the rules of democracy. You know, the, the power here is with the people of Scotland, and that's okay. the way the final, the final, it is. Okay. That's the way it should the final be, and that's the way it will this. always be. Final point on this, which is you you don't like the idea of Brexit, right? You don't, mm -hmm. like, you don't like the idea of us going off on our own <laughs> from a big, safe large entity, and yet, at the same time, you love the idea of doing that to the UK. And many people might be saying, well, hang on, Nicola Sturgeon, <laughs> where are you ideologically with this? How can you want to be part of a European Union with all the issues that that raises, but you don't want to be part of the United Kingdom? Well, if the two things were the same, you might have a point, but they're not. The European Union, and it's not perfect, I, I don't think it is flawless, but it is a union of independent countries. You know, the fact that France and Germany are part of the EU does not stop them being independent. Contrast that with the UK, where Scotland's position in the UK right now means that we have no alternative but to be dragged out of the European Union against our will. If Scotland was independent, a relationship with the rest of the UK doesn't end. It, it becomes, in my view, better and stronger because we're a partnership of And have you worked out what you would do about the, the EU border? Is. If you, if a you're partnership of Final question. If, you, if, you work, if, you, if you're successful, and you have a good election, you force through another referendum, Scotland this time votes to leave, have you worked out what mm. to do about the border yet? A free border between Scotland and England, just as I want uh, free borders uh, with uh, Scotland and the UK and the single market. But you can't answer these questions because we don't yet know what the border is going to be between the UK and the EU. You know, we're a month away from the end of the no, transition period. But isn't that the whole point? And we still don't know whether point? there's going to be we, a we deal. Don't, so when we don't, well, we don't know but because it is, actually but it is it's the almost whole point. impossible. It's almost impossible to do it without a hard border. That's why it's not been resolved. So again, I just ask you: if you get your wish, well, it's not impossible. How are you going to, to, are you going to avoid not... a hard border? Well, what are you going to do? You know, build well, a new, a new bouncy version of Hadrian's Wall. What's going to happen? Uh, look, I, I want free trade between Scotland and the rest of the UK, and I want to be part of the single market. Now, it's not uh, an irrelevant point. We don't know. A month away from the end of the transition period, we don't know what the UK relationship with the EU is going to be. Maybe we'll get some detail of that this week. Who knows? Okay. Uh, but let's see what that's going to be, and then I'll answer these 
questions, but I'll answer from the point of principle. And uh, the principle at heart here is the ability of people in Scotland, wherever they come from, to choose their own future. Right now, our future has been dictated to us by Boris Johnson and his uh, band of Brexiteers, and a majority of people in Scotland do not want that. Nicola Sturgeon, always good to talk to you. Thank you very much for joining us. You too. Thank you.